Okay. All right. I think we're going to go ahead and uh, I've got three minutes past, so we'll go ahead and get get this get this show going. Um, again, thank thank everyone for coming out to Renola Gardens. Um, the Tuesday gardening series has you know always been popular, and we're happy to keep it going. Um, and we've got some people online, and that was one of the lessons learned from the pandemic was you know, to still make it available if you can't get here, you know, if you can't find a parking space to, when you get here. Um, that's always a perennial challenge here. Um, but just to, you know, make it available, and we've been recording these, so, you know, if you want to go back and relook at them, we've got a YouTube channel that we're trying to make sure all of our recordings are on there. Um, that you can go back and review. Hey, you know, I missed what they were saying. It's an easy way to go sit down and have a coffee at home and rewatch. Um, but that being said, just to give a little preview of what else is uh, coming up at, um, later on this week, uh, the Winston Salem Rose Society will be out uh, as they are every year to do their uh, rose pruning clinic. And this is a great way to learn if if you're you know just want need a refresher course or if you're just getting into roses of how to properly do that first cut back of the season, um, and that'll happen Thursday and Friday from ten to, ten to twelve. Um, you know, a little later on in the season, we've added something new, and that'll be you know when the roses do their fir first big flush of flowers, um, we're going to try to time it with doing the first deadheading of the season. So you'll be able to work with experts, you know, the Rose Society, also Forest All Red. I think we've got a ghost. Um, Catherine? Um, <laughs> always when the lights flicker. Um, but, you know, it's, it could be a little overwhelming if you really haven't grown roses of how, you know, how do I cut? I always love it when people are like, I'm afraid I'm going to hurt them. You won't hurt them. Um, you know, they'll, they'll fight back. Um, but it, you know, just a little something else to add about learning about roses, and we enjoy this partnership with the Rose Society of bringing their expertise in. Um, just as we're, you know, starting this relationship with the Orchid Society, hopefully, all, you know, y'all got were able to come out this past weekend to see the Orchid Show. Um, it was a tremendous success. Um, they were very happy about it, and this is something we, we want to keep building on of being this the center of horticulture in the triad. Um, but that being said, we've got a couple programs coming up. Um, next next week, we won't be hosting anything online or in person. We've got a trip down to the Bartlett Arboretum. Um, you know, we're hopefully going to, hopefully the frost is going to just stay further north uh, to see the Magnolia Collection down there. It's the largest Magnolia Collection in the world. Um, but if Magnolias aren't your things, uh, good news, because on the 28th, we've got Dr. Dennis Werner. Um, he's an NC State professor. Uh, he was originally the peach breeder, but then he moved on to breeding red buds. So um, he was one of he was one of my favorite professors when I was at NC State. Um, he's behind, you know, if you've seen Ruby Falls, um, which is the purple leaf weeping red bud, Merlot, Flamethrower, um, I think it's Golden Falls. He's been behind all this breeding of some amazing red buds that are coming out. And I've seen some of the stuff that's still out in the research plots. There's more to come. Um, it's just amazing what he's doing, but he's going to talk about breeding red buds. Um, so that'll be exciting. Um, then on the 11th, we'll do our preview of the plant sale. So that's, you know, kind of a behind the scenes, what's coming up. So you can get really excited and, you know, go ahead and start setting money aside. Um, then we will have our container workshop working with Michelle. So this will be an opportunity you can 
bring a container of your own, you know, not something, you know, that you need a flatbed for, but a reasonably sized container. We'll have plants. You'll be able to work with Michelle and she'll show you some tips on, you know, doing some successful containers. Um, we also have a uh, talk on worm farming. Um, so that'll be interesting. And then, you know, just another thing, if you're a friend of Renolda Gardens, one of the things we've started doing this year is, is insider tours. So it's an opportunity, you know, and we've tried to time them some in the morning, some in the afternoon. Um, and the ones that are coming up, we're going to do a tour about bulbs, um, which if you've been out in the garden and seen like the blue and yellow garden, it's going to explode. Um, I think forest, I don't know how many bulbs you've crammed in there, but it's a lot. And, you know, I think some of our volunteers would agree too. Um, <laughs> I got a heck yeah from Chris. Uh, that'll be April 5th at 9 a.m. And th these are for, you know, friends of Renolda Garden. So if you're interested, reach out to Sarah Blackwell. Um, she'll get you on the list. And then the next one after that will be perennially yours, which will be a walk in the formal gardens. And we'll do that at 6.30 p.m. Uh, on May 16th. So really the perennial should be kicking, you know, by then. And hopefully, you know, Mother Nature will figured out what season she really wants to be in because it sure as heck doesn't feel like she's decided yet. Um, so, you know, a lot of great things happening at the gardens. Um, you know, we, we encourage you, if you're not a friend of the gardens, consider becoming one. Um, it supports everything we do from the gardening series to planting bulbs in the ground. Um, so with that being said, I want to introduce Larry Wise, uh, the president of the Rose Society, Winston-Salem Rose Society. Um, we're excited to have him here to give us a, a good walkthrough on being successful in growing your roses. So, Larry, thank you, John. There's a microphone for you. You can just flip that on. I haven't used the microphone that much before. My voice usually carries from here to Davie County, but uh, I want to thank all of you for uh, being here. This is. Uh, our new, uh, basically a new presentation that we have, and this is my first time going over it. So <clears throat> I apologize for any redundancy, but if I say something's worth, it's worth saying twice. So, and hopefully you'll write some of this down. Uh, feel free to uh, uh, ask questions. Just raise your hands or hand. Just one's all you need. It just And I'll see you or I won't, one or the other, but eventually. I need to get this way. Yeah. <clears throat> Let me just put the switch down. I'm going to turn it. Okay. I love it when he has trouble. Not really, but how many of you here are master gardeners? Oh boy, now I'm gonna have to tell the truth. Okay. And first time rose growers? <clears throat> Got any first time, your first time? Okay, that's good. All right, this is the agenda. Uh, I've already welcomed you. And then uh, not to go on an ego trip here, but it were introduction, introductions of Winston-Salem Rose Society. VIPs and Georgia Moore here is our brand new webmaster and Kathy Owens, our correspondent secretary, and she takes care of the clippings for us, which is a very important document that comes out of, of our programs. Okay, we're going to talk about selecting the rows, digging the hole, amending the soil, planting the rows, fertilizing, spraying, and tips making your work worth your time. Okay, and then later on, we'll talk about some upcoming uh, uh, meetings and events that we're going to have. Okay, roses need sun. They need, uh, if you read up, you'll notice that everything says we need at least six to eight hours of full sun a day. And I've grown enough roses in the shade to attest to that because it's complete failure. I put them in there just a little bit, just to just because I want to grow more roses and that didn't work. So money lost. Okay. Select a rose suitable for your growing zone and climate. I believe we're zone seven. Okay. And, uh, and the size, you need to be familiar with the growth habit and features. So when you're shopping for roses, either through a catalog 
or going to somewhere like uh, Myers Greenhouse locally here or um, Witherspoon Rose Culture, for example, look at the size of the, what the rows will be. There will be there will be signs that will tell you how big that rose will be. So, uh, for example, you don't want to have a, a tall firefighter hybrid tea sitting next to a, a little miniature rose like this cute little diamond eyes I have right here, which I'm going to give away as soon as I can figure out how I want to do it. So, uh, and then the health uh, health rating, yeah, you got to you got to purchase from a reputable source, and I'll mention a few of those as as we go through this. Uh, uh, the, the perfect rose, Witherspoon Rose Culture, Myers Greenhouse are all good sources to buy roses from locally. Uh, there are the good catalog sources to use. Okay. I'll get to those. Okay. All right. I'll get to those. I might even touch on Lowe's too. Okay. Okay. Come on now. I'm not doing anything wrong here. Did you? I press that. Press that. I guess I am. What yeah. 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 There's a button right below. On the Button's too close. It, you know, this is for me. This is just like typing on a cell phone. Yeah. It just doesn't work. My thumbs are too big. I apologize. Okay, this is really uh, important. When, when planting roses, you want to dig a, a really nice hole, a deep hole that's got uh, lots of drainage and then and you need area for the roots to, for the uh, roots to spread. Now, I'll be honest with you, when I plant a potted rose, in other words, one that uh, say I get from Witherspoon. Like in a pot like that? Yeah, like in a pot like that. I'm going to dig something that's bigger than 15 by 18, right? Because you have to add amendments to the soil, and we'll go over those. So when you put this in, you don't have a whole lot of room for backfill soil unless you've made a good size hole. And frankly, it, the, as much as these roses cost, except Home Depot, and uh, uh, as much as they cost, you really don't want to put a uh, just a little bit of effort into growing this rose, planting this rose. You want the rose to look good, smell good later on, and you're not going to dig in it, just digging a, a hole that's just, just something you're doing in a hurry. Okay. What do I have here? Now, also, when you order from catalogs, sometimes you can get bare root roses, okay? Now, I won't do quite as big a hole there because you've got room for soil, okay? Bare root roses, when they come in, what we, what we do, or, or a lot of cases, I'll say what I do, but there are plenty of ways to grow roses, all right? Just keep that in mind is I will put the entire rose, if it's bare root, into a five gallon container of water or larger if I have it. And I like to hydrate that rose as far up the cane as I can, okay? And then while that's happening, then you can compare, you can uh, fix your soil, okay, with the amendments and so forth. Okay, amending the soil, very important. Uh, just like uh, we say here, it's like baking a cake, okay? Uh, we use gypsum a lot. That's you, you almost can't use too much gypsum. And after you dig your hole, you can dig some further holes or just poke it in there, poke a stick in there, and this allows everything that you put in to penetrate deeply. Why would you use gypsum? Gypsum is uh, because of the clay that we have in a lot of the soils here and that loosens up the soil. Gypsum is good stuff. We like to use that, okay. All right, and lime, 
is uh, almost uh, it's you, you almost can't do without it. But I'm not going to get into the soil testing aspect of this because it'll scare half of you away. And and uh, this this is something you you can take care of later on. Okay. All right. <clears throat> What I like to do as part of my amendments is uh, I use some Daddy Pete's products. Now, Daddy Pete's, and you can buy it locally. You can buy it at places like uh, uh, Shouse Nursery or, or Riverside Farm and Garden in, in uh, Vienna. Okay, it's located right across, right across from the fire department. Um, the... Um, the, the important thing about the Daddy Pete's is we think they're good products, but here again, I'm not trying to endorse, the Risen State and Rose Society is not trying to endorse any particular product one over the other. Kind of like the manure. I like Daddy Pete's manure. Some people might like black cow. Either one's fine. Okay. All right. But the one thing about uh, the Daddy Pete's that I like is I use a planting mix with permatil, and that's little pieces of slate in there that you that you mix in with your with your soil that you've already dug out. Okay, and what the, what this permatil does is that it makes the rose area drain better. It also discourages moles and voles. I have a hard time with voles in, in my garden. Period. The voles go everywhere. And if I can get this uh, permatil in the ground, and you can also buy bags of permatil at a place like Shouse Nursery, they have, and so does Riverside Farming Garden. Okay, now uh, there's the planting mix that I talked about right there, and you can see it says with permatil. Okay, so we go ahead and uh, mix all this good stuff up. Some people might want to put cotton seed meal. Some want to put blood meal. You can use any of that stuff, okay? And uh, <clears throat> the third item is a cup of superphosphate. You really don't need but about a half a cup of this. This is more than a half a cup, but this is 0 0.46, 0, I think, 0 0.45. And you can buy that at uh, local big box stores, okay? And this is something you only do one time, okay? Okay, planting the rows. Very important. Add more of the removed soil and lime mixture so when you set the rose bush in the hole, the crown, and that's, well, I can't show, I don't have hyper T, but you can see right there, is just a level or about a, a one inch above the ground, okay? I make sure that I actually go over the bud union a little bit when I first plant a rose because the soil is gonna settle, okay? You gotta think about that too, okay? And <clears throat> you fill the uh, remaining soil and you fill there and the water well and form a three inch trench about eight inches from the crown and the, the bush to hold the water. A lot of times I'll add water hey, two or three times during the process of planting a rose. Watering is the one thing that you can't slack off on during the entire rose growing season. You've got to have water if you, if you want the roses to stay healthy. Add two cups of alfalfa pellets, meal to the, or meal to, to a trench, water well and cover with the soil. Now, you can also use something like a cottonseed meal. Alfalfa pellets, I use those a lot, but that's because I make alfalfa tea, which is just like making manure tea. Uh, and if you just have a few roses, I, I don't know that going to a feed store and buying a 50, 50 pound bag of alfalfa meal is gonna be something you wanna do but you can put it on about anything. So you might be able to make it work. That's why your cotton seed meal, you can get that at a feed store and somewhere like Clemens Millage the Company, they sell it by the pound and grow get as much or as little as you need. 
All right, one other little thing that I like to add to the soil, I didn't mention this earlier, is um, bone meal in lieu of lime, or I like to put in two quarts of worm castings. Uh, I tried growing worm using, <laughs> I don't grow worm castings, that's not something you can grow, but um, I've tried using worm castings before, just uh, planting some herbs and I planted one with worm castings and one without worm castings and the difference in the size was like this. Worm castings really help the herbs to grow up, to take off. Okay. Chemical fertilizers. Uh, we're slowly in some respects trying to move away from chemical fertilizers. Here's an example of 10, 10, 10. Uh, that's a little story about that. When you're planting new roses, you don't use any chemical fertilizers, okay? Not for a year. Doesn't matter if it's bare root or potted, no chemical fertilizers. You can wait for a couple of weeks and then start with some liquid fertilizers like kelp meal or uh, fish emulsion. All right. The thing about 10, 10, 10 is the convenience of it is we have some rose growers and they feed, feed their roses 10, 10, 10, a one cup, once a month, they scratch it in and water it. Oh, by the way, be sure to water the day before too. Anytime you're using a chemical fertilizer, it's a good idea to water the day before you put the fertilizer down. Uh, you don't want to take the chance of burning your roots, but water after you put it in and you'll be you'll be fine with it. And they don't do anything else. They just feed them once a month and be done with it, okay? Uh, what I've done before is I've used 10, 10, 10. That's the most common fertilizer you can buy that keep changing the blends. And I will take uh, a miracle Grow and use it in the off weeks. In other words, every two weeks they get, get fed something. We have some members who like to grow the biggest and best roses possible and they feed them a little something every week, a little something different. Why? Because roses are very heavy feeders. Okay. Uh, that's my woods in the background, but this is some of the products that I use. Uh, Osmo Coat is, is a good one to use. Uh, Mills Magic Easy Feed, and that's basically one tablespoon to the gallon of water. And I've got the liquid seaweed that I use. New rose growers, you, know, you really don't need all this, but I like to exhibit roses. So I like to, I like to give them something just, you know, at least two or three times a month, okay? But if you, instead of 10, 10, 10, you can give them the liquid easy feed and that does just fine too. There's all different ways I'm trying to impart to you the different ways that you can feed your roses. Uh, I'm gonna stop for a minute. Does anybody feel that, that I'm speaking too fast or they're overwhelmed? Anybody Anybody want to admit that they're overwhelmed? <laughs> well, that's that's our relationship. I just, you know. Many people lie. Many of our members do all this. We get all this standing That That's true. But I'm retired, as you are. How about the lettuce slow release fertilizer? I think that'll work just fine. Uh, Witherspoon has good products. <clears throat> you can use that. I would, whatever you do, whether you spray or feed, do it per label instructions. Okay, that's my that's my other disclaimer. <laughs> do it per label instructions, and if uh, if the instructions say okay to plant with it and fine, you do that, okay? I've never used a product, but I know how they work. I bought roses from Witherspoon and really not been uh, disappointed, okay? But uh, here, I won't go any further with that. Now, in fertilizing, okay, I've, I've touched on some of that. And uh, the, you also need to add a cup of Epsom salts, half a cup, to encourage basal break, 
basil break is basically a new stem coming out of the bud union. That's what you want. That's how your rose gets bigger. Okay. All right. <laughs> Once per month, started in May, after the soil has warmed up, you can use a half a cup of dry uh, organic fertilizers, such as uh, there's something called a, a dry version of Mills Magic or liquid organic fer fertilizer, which I touched on right there. Oh yeah, I made it go backwards. That's pretty good. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. <clears throat> Stop feeding the fertilizer after the after late August feeding to allow the plants to get ready for winter. Uh, what I haven't mentioned a whole lot of is we take steps as members to avoid disease as much as possible. Black spot being the number one fungal disease that we all have to put up with, okay? So the reason to stop uh, fertilizing is we don't want the rose, encourage the rose to really grow any more new, have any more new growth. Because if you had a hard freeze, like, like we could have in the next couple of nights, that will kill off the new growth and that's where disease can set in over, over the winter, okay? Now, uh, how to feed the roses? Well, that's pretty pretty basic. Uh, and I've mentioned this earlier, and I, I think all three of those steps right there are, are important to remember. Okay. All right. Now, the one difference that I have with this, and we're going to change our presentation on this. I should have caught this. But when the feed, after pruning, okay, and I think what we're meaning here is after your pruning that we're going to be doing later on this week, but most of us will wait till late March or early April because we don't want to get our roses cut back and have die back, okay, because of the freeze. We give them a high nitrogen fertilizer, something that's got a uh, nitrogen rate of 18 or higher, okay? Now, if you've got 10, 10, 10, that's fine, but I would suggest using a quarter cup of urea. You're gonna have to get that online somewhere. I can't find anybody around here that has urea. They used to, it used to be sold in five pound, uh, five pound uh, bags, but I haven't been able to find it. And that gives it, you want to give your roses a real kick when they first start growing in uh, April. Okay. Now, if you have roses, you probably, they're probably covered with leaves right now, right? Okay. All right. We'll go forward. Here's some of the roses that uh, members grow. Uh, I grow the Double Delight. Um, I do not grow the Francis Dubril, but it's a beautiful rose. Uh, I, I grow the St. Patrick, and this picture was taken by one of my work colleagues several years ago, and the background was a computer screen. <laughs> Off, obviously, but, uh, and then Dolly Parton. Dolly's always a, a, a favorite for a lot of rose growers. All right, now spraying fungicide for disease. Okay. I like to use the, the BioAdvance. This used to be called Bayer, by the way, but you can always identify it by the Royal Blue Bottle. Okay. And the BioAdvance is, is disease control for roses, flowers, and shrubs. And I like to use it because I found it to be the most effective in, uh, in my garden. I, if, if that's all you used, uh, you might still get some black spot in late July or August. That, that nasty fungus is almost irrepressible. There's other things you can do, but I'm not going to go with, go over that now. All right. And, uh, there is another, uh, bio advanced product I'll get it to, but this one's a good one to buy. There's other good ones out there here again. This is what works for me and other members. Okay. And then spraying uh, is another thing that 
Uh, it's really it's become a controversial topic over the years. Uh, you're going to have to spray roses. You're just going to have to do it. Otherwise, your, your roses are going to get eaten up with, by pests. And the things like aphids, uh, I've found that uh, I get aphids like clockwork every spring. I mean, I could just sit a clock by April 1, I've got April, green aphids. They just line up like little soldiers on my leaves. Okay. And you can, you can spray them off with water if you want to, or you can spray them with uh, neem oil. Neem oil is kind of a, a well kept secret. It's just it, it will it will do the trick. Okay, thrips are a major pain. Uh, what thrips are is they're they're just little bugs, for lack of a better word. That's such an all encompassing term, bugs. But they're very small, and what they do, they're kind of butterscotch color, and they get into the base of your rosebud, and just sort of eat out, suck out the juices. And that's why you'll see roses sometimes, especially your lighter colored roses, that will turn brownish around the edge, okay? And if you wanna know if you got thrips, pretty easy, just cut off a rose, turn it upside down over a piece of white paper, thump the head a little bit like that, and you'll see all these little critters, okay? There are cures for those. Uh, the complete insect killer will help. Seven will help. Uh, cane borers are, uh, they have other names, but, but what a cane borer does is it finds the tip of your rose, one of your canes, and they just bore an absolutely perfectly concentric hole right down in it, lay their eggs, the eggs latch larva, and then that they live off the pulp and the cane dies, okay? So how do you work around that? The cane borers, all you got to do, what helps a lot is when you prune your roses, you cut them at a 45 degree angle. Okay. Just like this, about like this. Now, when you're pruning, let's talk about pruners for just a minute. Uh, these are called bypass pruners. Okay. You don't want to use anvil pruners. Okay. And when you use bypass pruners uh, like these, uh, and you really shouldn't use anything else for trimming or cutting your roses, is you want the blade to be on the bottom side because the thicker part here can actually crush the cane, okay, if you use it upside down. And that can also let disease set in. So here again, that's one way you can discourage an insect without having to spray for it. And uh, some people don't get cane borers. I get them. So and I found a few that do this, that, that it really works well if I cut it at a 45 degree angle. If I do go straight across, I might be asking for a little trouble later on. Japanese beetles, our favorite. Okay. Japanese beetles really bring up a, a real conundrum for gardeners rose growers, and why? Uh, they eat everything in sight. Really, the only thing that we found that effectively kills them is seven. That's the good news. The bad news is seven is toxic to honeybees. Okay, so you're, you've got a con personal conundrum, you know, how much disease can, not disease, but how much Japanese beetle damage can you tolerate before you just say, I can't stand this anymore and it's spray seven. And when you do, that's fine. Just top mist the blooms and the leaves. You don't have to spray the whole bush. Uh, when you're spraying in general, keep in mind that you don't want to uh, kill the beneficial insects that are in there. So that's why you need to limit your spray area. Okay. And we like, you can see those, there are others. <laughs> that you can find by big box stores. This is just some of the stuff that we use. But this complete insect killer will do a number on Japanese beetles. Now, okay. There are a couple other things that we use. Uh, now you uh, give, now is where you get to learn all the good stuff, okay? All right. 
uh, there's a chemical that's called manzate. And I have that. And the only time I use it is when I do get black spot and uh, I want to go ahead and kill the spores. Manzate is fairly cheap as chemicals go. You can buy it at the big box stores. Manzate is a contact killer for spores. The minute that spray hits the spore, spore dies. Okay, it's just that you have to spray real well. Now also about spraying in general, you wanna be sure that you get the underside of the rose bush, okay? Just spray up this way, okay? You wanna cover it completely. All right. Uh, another product that, uh, that uh, people like to use is the uh, BioAdvanced all-in-one or three-in-one. And if that's all you use to do your roses, you may work out just fine. Okay, here again, uh, to use those, I would recommend that you do it about every 10 days in the month of July and August, because that's when you can have the most trouble with the diseases and the critters, okay? All right, one other little thing, maybe some of you have people, do, do you have a loan service? That's great, my loan service is me. Um, <clears throat> Loan services this time of year like to put out a product that's called Weed and Feed, right? If that touches your roses, you're going to have trouble. It'll it'll burn them really bad. So make sure that you that you know that. Make sure that your loan service people know that they should already. But just in case, it's a it's a it's a wise idea to go over that and make sure they know. Okay. Uh, the use of fish emulsion in liquid kelp worked for me pretty well. It's easy on the roses, no chance of it being burned, and uh, I, and it makes the roses go well. Now, one other thing that I did is uh, I have pulled the mulch away from all of my roses at least a couple of feet or something like that. And the reason for doing that is you want the, the ground to warm up as quickly as it can, okay? The mulch just gets in the way of that, right? Okay, you, you'll need it in June, July, and August. All right, some people take the mulch completely away, throw it away and replace it with new mulch. If you wanna spend the money, good thing to do. If you can get leaf mulch from the city of Winston-Salem, great thing to do. It's free. All you got to do is figure out how to get it to your house. <laughs> All right. Now we've talked about, uh, or I've talked about a number of roses up here. We've I've had pictures and uh, we'll leave that up there. And one of my favorites is called Dick Clark. Okay. Dick Clark is America's oldest teenage rose. That's how I introduced it. All right. And you can buy it from different catalogs. Okay. None of other people have here locally have carried it that I can that I can see, but I've won a lot of ribbons at the fair and with our road show, which is June third this year, uh, with Dick Clark. It's just a beautiful rose. It grows a lot. It's about like a five by five and a half or six foot tall rose. It takes up a lot of space, but it blooms a lot. It's a heavy bloomer. Another good one to get is one that's called Firefighter. Okay. Firefighter uh, has a scent much like Mr. Lincoln. And Mr. Lincoln is probably the universally most popular rose in the world, okay? And uh, Mr. Lincoln is, is great in the spring and great in the fall, but not so great, great during the summer. Okay, I showed you a, <clears throat> a yellow rose earlier, that one that was taken up against uh, my computer screen. The St. Patrick, St. Patrick is a beautiful rose. Uh, <clears throat> you can buy it at Witherspoon and probably at uh, uh, the Perfect Rose. The, the uh, We have trouble with that sometimes because it's not as winter hardy as we would like it to be. But if you've got an area in your garden that, or, or area that that's, or like maybe in a container, for example, 
that you can give that road some protection in the winter time. That was a that was a great one to grow. You saw that picture. You know it was beautiful. Even if I grew it, it was beautiful. Okay, so uh, give it a try if you want to. But I think it's the most yellow, most beautiful yellow rose in existence. It's got a little bit of green trim, a little green color around the edge that uh, basically can vary. Uh, that can vary based on the kind of soil that you have. Okay, now. The last tip I can give you is to stop and smell the roses. My goodness, you put all this work into it, okay? Uh, or made somebody else put the work into it. And you need to stop and smell. I will caution you to be careful. Uh, I had a, just the most beautiful firefighter and I just took a little sniff of it and walked away and I was admiring the bud and out comes a bumblebee. Oh, so that must have been my lucky day. All right. I believe the last thing that I want to mention is these little four-legged creatures, creatures called deer. Okay. They have they have given all of us trouble. They have given me particularly vicious trouble the last couple of years. And uh what do you do about it? I've tried all the sprays. I've tried the solar powered, okay? They're worthless. I mean, they're like a deer call to me, okay? All right. And, oops, excuse me. I, I have used the deer scram. That seems to work pretty well, okay? It's only one problem. They like you to, deer scram requires you to, to, Put it on the ground and one foot swaths about two or three feet apart. But the other side of my main rose bed is a driveway. <laughs> so I've got, so what I wind up doing is, uh, and here again, I'm retired. I can take the time to do this. The roses are wet. Did I get a couple of cups of this stuff? And I go around and just mist it over the top of the buds. Okay. And that works out just fine. And frankly, a lot of these will work out until it rains. And that's, that seems to be when the deer come, come out the most is after a nice rainstorm. What's, what you can have the best luck with is some kind of a, a fence. Some people use an electric fence, okay? I've got kids on both sides of me. That sort of negates. Oh, I wouldn't mind if some of them ran into the fence once in a while, but but I don't, I don't put that in there. So you can use some nice post and some fish line, fishing line. And uh, that's what I would recommend uh, to, to keep them taken away from the curb appeal of your house. Fish line is not visible from the road, okay? But when the deer bump up against it, they back off. And that seems to be the most effective way. The bad thing about the sprays, not to, it's not to the use of them themselves. It's that you don't find out that they don't work till it's too late. You come out in the morning and your roses look like somebody went over one of the hedge trimmers. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, I've got the 130. So I went over this faster than I thought. But then again, I didn't want to overwhelm anybody here. So if anyone wants to... Uh, uh, ask questions, uh, please, please do so. And if I can't answer your question, we've got your email addresses, at least most of you, you will get a response, okay? I just want you to know that there's more than one right way to grow a rose. You shouldn't be intimidated. Uh, the, uh, yeah, let me have any questions if you, if you got them right now. Yes, ma'am. Of where you uh, are planting them and take the whole, I think you have all the. Um, I will be sending the PowerPoint on um, how mm -hmm. a PDF and PowerPoint. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Eva. 
I have two bit volume one climbers uh -huh. on trellises. One's mm -hmm. on the east side of the house, one's on the west side. Mm -hmm. um, they were in full foliage all winter long. And I mean, last year they dropped their foliage for the main part. So yeah. They have, they look beautiful. Yeah. Like normal? Because I thought it was, was it just that warm last year? Or? Yeah. Yes, I've I've got a sister-in-law who has a big climber. I don't know what kind it is. Uh, climbers are not one of my strengths, but she had it growing up on the south and southeast side of the, of her house, and that is I don't know that it ever goes into dormancy. Well, and these are these will bloom in part shape. That's what mm -hmm. sounds like a zephyr and druin. It is a zephyr. Good. I hit one right. Okay. And yes, sir. That's called Deer Scram. You can buy it at site one and it's over a hundred dollars. But it lasts you a long time. I've had that bucket for four years. Okay. I mean if you spend that kind of money, you want to get some some something out of it, right? Yes, yes, Nancy. It's important to remember to grow your roses organically too. Go online and say, you know, just organic rose growing. I spray a lot of things. I put my rose bed sprays for festivals. I have another hundred and fifty roses in the garden itself. So there is an extract of chrysanthemum that you can spray. You can all kinds of things. And I have no trouble getting lots of bees, lots of butterflies. But there are different ways you can use. And when I gave this talk a few years ago right here, the man sitting in the front row said, oh, my God, this is so difficult. And I said, it, sir, it's not brain surgery. And what you did for a little piece, and I'm brain surgery. <laughs> <laughs> Specializing in something like Larry, who was, as I go to see his roses, because they're so fabulous. You don't see my roses because I have bees. Um, they're they're perfectly acceptable as they are. So don't don't get overwhelmed with it. No, no, please please don't. Uh, message. Yes. Yes. Uh, I have David Austin roses, and neem oil seems to burn the leaves. Any suggestions as to how to avoid leaf burn? Um. Uh, that's the first I've heard of the neem oil. The, the the whatever this person is using, they must be using it at a strength greater than label instructions. Hold off until the end of the do the prune. He said, as much as the, the roses have leafed out, do we wait until the end of the month to do that pruning? By the way, David Austin roses, when they say six to eight feet, they mean 10 to 12 feet. All of these okay, I just wanted to check on that. Okay, bye. Okay, I want to go back to planting. There's another method that you can plant. Okay, this is easy. Now, I've mentioned earlier that you don't use granular fertilizer when you're planting a rose. We'll all stand by that. There's always that chance it'll burn your roots. I have, I want to try it this year. I, I found an excuse to get rid of some one of my roses, so now I got an open spot. So I'm going to take the rose, but this time I'm going to, with my planting mix and so forth, I'm going to put in one or two ounces of Osmocote. Okay. Yeah. Osmocote won't burn the roots. You don't want to have the roots direct contact with it, but just put Osmocote down in a hole, cover it up with a couple inches of uh, of your fill mix before you put in the rose, okay? And then have another another ounce or two, no more than four ounces of Osmocote with your backfill. You've got your rose growing and fertilized for the year, basically, okay? I don't know how many rose growers in our society use this method, but I'm gonna try it and I will be reporting back. Okay. Oh, God, this thing is too heavy. No, I'm gonna give it away. 
And uh, all right, this is the fun part about planting rows. Okay, one of the keys that I haven't mentioned earlier is when you plant your potted rows. Okay, you don't want to disturb the row the uh, root system that's in there. Okay, so once you've put the rows or a, a container this size down in the hole already just to be sure it's going to fit, okay? You take, the, you take the container, you cut all the way around the bottom, okay? All the way around the bottom to take the bottom completely off and then cut it up the side right here to about right there, okay? Then you put it in the hole and then you can put your backfill around it. And then when you're satisfied after you've watered it in some more, and when you're satisfied that you've got it in the right spot and the right depth, take your, I wouldn't suggest using pruners. You find something else that's sharper because these can dull your pruners. Cut the, the remaining section there. Pull the bucket away, lift it up and away. Voila, you got a planted rose with undisturbed roots. A lot of plants, grows is included, if you disturb the roots, sets back to growing, they can put the rows, if you've messed, messed up, messed with the roots enough, they can put it into shock, okay? And that takes time to recover. But this is a neat thing to do when you want to plant anything that's in a container this size. Really works for me. Okay. Now, bare root roses. Bare root roses are usually the, one of the best ways to buy a rose because it's usually on their own roots, which makes them less susceptible to disease, makes them a stronger rose bush. When you're planting a bare root rose, after you've received it, soak it for a couple of days in water, okay, all the way up as far as you can. And then while it's soaking, you can prepare your hole like we've talked. What you do is build up a cone in the bottom of the hole, you know, like a, like this a little cylinder, and you, you take the the uh, rose out of the water. Look at how the roots are arranged, and if there are any that look damaged or or too long, snip them off. It's okay to do that, and then you set it on down on the top of the soil, okay, that you have in your hole. And then take your hand and pull it, pull pull so uh, pull uh, soil in there, give it some water, and then put in. What you don't want to do is have a bunch of air down in the holes when you're planting the bare root rows. Okay, but if you order from catalogs, there's a good chance you'll get it, and you, you'll know the catalog should tell you whether you'll get it one is bare root or one gallon. Now. Another school of thought, and the the rosarians that I know that are, are really good, they highly recommend taking a rose that you bought in a one gallon container or a bare root, and instead of putting it in the hole in your garden, you put it in this for about two months. Okay, now why do that? Aren't you planting a rose twice? Well, yeah, yeah, you are. But what this will allow the rose to do is get a root system, grow a new root system in a little bit more confined space. The process is called hardening off, okay? And then a couple months later, uh, then you can dig your hole and plant your rose in accordance with the methods that I've just told you. I mean, here again, none of these roses are cheap. Don't use cheap labor to plant your rows. Your labor is expensive, I know. Okay, so just just please keep that in mind. That's just another just another method, just another thought. It's not a must do, but it's it's worked for me before. I don't know any time that it has. Are there any more questions? Yes, Georgia. What I leave out? Um, not about if you wanted to plant a rose in a container, what would you recommend for that? Well, container roses, uh, first of all, uh, that's an excellent question. And first of all, you need a big enough container. Now, some of our 
our consulting rosarians uh, who are really knowledgeable rose growers, they have a lot of roses in containers. Our former president, Steve Lawson, who is manager of the uh, Brookstown Inn, Steve has all 200 of his roses in pots. And they're about this big around. But there is a mix that uh, I have read about that, that will work real well. I'm gonna try to give you some of the uh, in, ingredients of that. But the first thing you do with the container is you put gravel in the bottom of the container. So if you're following it, so that would make you think, well, I need to put this rose, put the container where I want it. I don't want to fix my rose now and then move it later on. That's a lot of trouble. Okay, <laughs> that should be too heavy for me. And then you use the, uh, you can use some, uh, the best quality poly mix or planting mix that you can find. You can add to it some blood meal, cotton seed meal, um, some mushroom compost. By the way, I didn't say much about uh, mushroom compost, but that's what I'm gonna mulch my rose garden with this year is mushroom compost. I'll put that down in May or June. Okay, you can buy that at Riverside Farm and Garden too. Okay, yes. Mm -hmm. I hate to answer a question with a question, but are you satisfied with the way the rose grows? <laughs> Well, if you're satisfied, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? Yeah. Or however that goes. Yes, Nancy. Drainage is really important. I don't care if you're putting it in your soil or in a pot. Yeah. It has to drain. You can put as much uh, gravel at the bottom of the pot as you want. But if it isn't a little bit elevated, it holds in the bottom, that water back up to fill. Mm -hmm. I, I remember when I first moved here and I dug a hole. I was told to put two gallons of water in to see how long it was supposed to drain. It didn't drain very long. And Doug Traver said, your rose is going to die. Yeah. You, you yeah. need really good drainage to dry very thin. Have some stuff and dig up the bigger hole because we do have clay here. Yeah. So we need something else to do. Good point. Yes. Yeah, that's where the gypsum comes in. That, and that's where the permatil helps. I mean, if you got red clay, you've got to work with a little bit more, okay? I I have uh, some sandstone under one of my rose beds, and every time I have to dig a rose out or replace it or something like that, I run into the sandstone, and I try to get some more of that out of there. Over the years, I've noticed that my topsoil has been getting lower and deeper into it which is good. That's, that's the result of all the mulch and basically the mulch and feeding that, that uh, I've been doing over the years. Um, when I hope to talk about the clinic we've got next couple of days, uh, Thursday and Friday, uh, bring, bring your pruners, okay? And you can buy some of these cute little things right here. Okay, at uh, Home Depot or Lowe's, and this is for getting the small twiggy growth out. Now, <clears throat> I have yet to meet anybody who's donated more blood to the rose garden than I have. My... All right. If you can get welding gloves. <laughs> Yeah, some people like to buy those and use those. These are called West County, and it's and I get these from Rosemania. Uh, get it online, and as you can see, they're kind of worn. This is what thorns have done. Okay, see that, and it's not so bad here. So guess if I'm left-handed or right-handed, right? Okay, very important. Another thing that's very important, 
since I'm flip-flopping back the tips, be sure you're up to date on your shots, tetanus in particular, okay? There are soil-borne diseases you can get doing any kind of gardening, not just rose growing, okay? So be sure your tetanus shots is boosters up to date. Not so sure about smallpox, but tetanus for sure, okay? All right, uh, any more questions? Or ordering online, you can look up that rose on your telephone and see what rating it is. Anything below is 7.5 or 7.5. Yeah. Lowe's and Home Depot do have roses. They mm -hmm. come to the top, like in those home improvements. You have a better chance. And they have mm -hmm. fabulous roses. Ones in bags, no. They've been in a bag for months. So who knows? But some of my best ones. I've perished and they come to the lawn. They're fabulous. So, how much effort you put in um, is what you get. Okay. Um, this rose right here, see how pretty that is? That's actually a miniature rose. <clears throat> and it has the name of Cooper. Easy to grow. Uh, might be a little annoying to some because it kind of spreads out a little bit, okay? But to me, it's worth it. That that rose is probably as about as close to a perfect exhibition stage as you can have, okay? Miniatures are, uh, we've got a Mr. Miniature in our rose society named James Richardson, and he's, he's uh, God's gift to rose growing. This one right here, the pink one is called Pretty Lady Ropes, I've got that, okay? And that is from the Downton Abbey series of roses. You didn't know that, did you? Okay, and that and that's just a really, really good one. And you can order that one online. Well, yeah, if you wanted, if you were starting out with roses, you know, probably, Six is probably a good number to start with, okay? It's provided you have the space. You, The the, the bigger the rows, the more space you want to allow for it, okay? Um, and I would start out with something like a Mr. Lincoln uh, firefighter. Um, uh, there is a beautiful purple rose called a Melody Parfumé, okay? And I bring that up because these are all what I found to be easy to grow roses. The Cooper is a nice miniature to have. Uh, another miniature is called Daddy Frank. And these, I don't have disease issues with too much. Okay. All right. Hey, Larry. Yes, sir. Seasons. Uh, last year, uh, Rosetta came to visit me. Uh -oh. Wiped out some uh, roses. Anything new on that? Any? advice for what's left over? That is an excellent question and thank you. I hoped I was going to try to avoid it keep scaring people. <laughs> but uh, let me give you a, re a really good answer for this. Uh, in short, the answer is not anything yet. Uh, we have a district meeting, a North Carolina's district meeting every January. And officers and any other member go this time it was in uh, Columbia, South Carolina. And we did have a professor from the uh, University of Tennessee get online with us as a Zoom presentation and uh, explain that they're they're looking at different things. Nothing really works yet. But if you can catch the disease early on, now how do you know you got the disease? If you have a rose bush that all of a sudden starts standing up fresh new growth with about three times as many thorns as it should have, in other words, it's a cane that looks entirely different than anything that helps in the rose, there's a good chance that you've got the rose rosette virus, okay? The normal method of treating this disease is shovel pruning. Okay, shovel pruning is digging it out, okay? and uh, then planting something else there. <clears throat> if you dig it out, you wanna be sure you get as much of the roots as you can, but as long as the roots are covered up, if there's any remaining roots, as long as they're covered up, you're gonna be okay. 
But if you catch it early enough, there's some credence, I'll say that, being given to just taking that particular cane, cutting it right off at the base of the bud union, just all off as you can. And then taking, I would take some uh, wood glue, to seal it up real good. That's what I would do. And you might not get it back. The rose rosette virus is spread by an eriophid mite. You can't see it. It's, it's blind. It can't see you either. But it's really small. You can see it through a microscope, and they just blow with the wind, okay? And if you've got somebody across the street, the worst ones that I see are knockouts. Oh, they get eaten up with them. They go to some of the places, commercial, with you know, I won't mention the restaurants, but they've got they've got the roses that are just heating up with it, and you just want to go tell somebody, get rid of those. Okay. But they're still working. There are a lot of, you know, Texas AM's working on it, Clemson's working on it, uh, University of Tennessee's working on it. So there's a lot of departments that are looking at this and trying to find a cure for it because the, the rosette can just wipe out. Everything. That's good. So she called it early, most likely. Yeah. Okay. You got it before the wind blew. Yes, ma'am. But is the soil drench worth doing? Or do they, but is there anything that survives in the soil? Or that you I don't know. I don't know the answer to that because the 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 the, the mites get through it through the wind. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, I, I don't know. It's worth a try. You're not going to yeah. hurt your rose. It's already getting hurt. So. That's it. Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. I water from the base so I know how much they're getting. Uh, you water more when the weather gets hotter. Uh, the standard is at least an inch of water a week, but in July and August, you need to bump that up some. So what I try to do is I want to be sure that my roses get five gallons of water. Now, when you do water, and thank you for that question, uh, when you do get half the water, you want to water it deeply. You just don't want to sit there and hold the hose over, you know, 20 seconds or so. You want to go around and give it a good deep soaking so it'll get all the way down to the roots. Okay. All right. It's amazing for me to be presenting this to all of you. I'm, I've, I've really enjoyed doing this. And while I'm speaking, the back of my mind's going, you left this out, you left that out. You know. So I did get back to mulching. When you plant a new rose, take some pine needles or something and mulch that thing all the way up to the top. Okay. And the reason for that is you don't want the rose canes to dry out. Okay, the, you have to give the rose bush some time for the roots to get established so they'll take up the water and grow like crazy. Okay, uh, if it's a bare root rose and you get chances are there won't be very many leaves on it. Uh, and that's what you reminded me when you mentioned the word desiccant. I take uh, the, the product called wilt proof and just spray it on there and let it dry, and that, that protects the rose. Okay. Any more questions before somebody? What's the next to the last page? It's our roadshow in June. And if anybody has a question about a road, they can ask one of our Rosarians and they'll come to their house and talk to them about it. Yeah, we have our Rosarians. I've done that a few times. They let me out, but they don't let me in. Okay. The uh, what I've tried to do today 
is dispel the notion that the Winston-Salem Road Society is all about exhibiting, okay? That's not the case. Probably two meetings in a year we talk about exhibiting, okay? Our, our road show is June 3rd. This is an accredited road show. We'll have people from North and South Carolina and some from Virginia come in and show their stuff, okay? It'll be open to the public uh, starting about, it's usually around one o'clock and it's at a, a home and garden building at the Dixie Classic Fair. Uh, I think my time's probably, did my time run out? Okay, the Dixie Classic Fair. If you want to bring something that you've been growing, bring it. We have a novice class. And that's the only way that you're going to figure out, you know, did you do the right things or not do the right things? A member will be there to help you show that rose, how to put it in the vase, you know, how to groom it a little bit, you know. And we will help you do that. That's that's what we want to do. Okay. That's June 3rd. We also do the majority of our exhibiting during the fair the uh, uh, in uh, October. Okay. I always want to call it Dixie Classic, but I know it's not that anymore. It's Carolina Classic. And the reason for that is that all the members who exhibit roses there, if we win some money, we funnel it all the way back to the Rose Society. That's our only fundraiser. Okay, so I'm not going to be asking for five bucks when you walk out the door. This is the only <laughs> only thing that we do. Okay, and bring a friend if you decide to come to one of our meetings, which is this coming uh, March. It'll be two weeks from the day. Yeah, two weeks from the day. You'll learn something. Okay, and maybe Jimmy Speece. Jimmy Speece is, is probably one of our most knowledgeable members. He is a little bit more polished than I am. I aspire to be as good as he is, but uh, if, if that's the case, then fine. Uh, let's see, did I? And thank you. Thank you for coming out. This, this was great, okay? And you get the rose because you were the first one here. There you go. You. I couldn't think of anything cute. Nobody had numbers. I'm sorry to hear my husband. I'm sorry to hear about you, Brad.